You're listening to a Rock Candy podcast. Hi, I'm Peter Santoscano, and this is Bubble and Squeak, a podcast with uncanny sounds, funny interludes, and stories. Most weird, many true. Okay, here's episode six. Our show today comes in three parts. Part one, Matt Billy from the podcast Bleeped talks about censorship. From drag queen story hour to Maplethorpe's nude photos to climate change, Matt exposes the censors. Part two, a prank call I made in 2010. I called up sex advice expert Dan Savage, host of the Savage Love podcast. I actually called in character as Marvin Bloom. Marvin asked about his struggles with anal sex. He believes Dan Savage must be the ass whisperer. And part three, a sound slice. Matt Billy hosts Bleeped, a documentary podcast about censorship and those who firmly stand up to it. I recently listened to episode five, Dylan's New Dress. I think that there's a lot of people that don't understand the hours put in to get into drag. But this is walking art right here. That's Dylan Pontiff. He's a drag queen who also goes by his stage name, Santana Pilar Andrews. It's not just me putting on a Mickey Mouse suit and walking out there and being a character. It takes time to look your your best. How long does it take you to do the makeup? It depends on how pretty I want to be. <laughs> so I want to say it took me about an hour to do my makeup for uh, Drag Queen Story Time. Dylan lives in Lafayette, Louisiana. Last August, he volunteered for Lafayette's first ever Drag Queen Story Time, which is exactly what it sounds like. Drag queens reading storybooks to groups of young children. The organizers gave Dylan a book called Jacob's New Dress. It's about a boy named Jacob who wants to wear a dress to school, but another boy in his class tells him that boys are not allowed to wear dresses. I I mean, I read it and I was like completely elated that there was a book that represented me. Since Drag Queen Storytime began in 2015, drag queens have been reading storybooks to children all over the country. In the beginning, the events mostly took place in LGBTQ-friendly cities like San Francisco and New York and were filled to capacity with eager children. But this wasn't San Francisco or New York. When you get a chance, check out the full episode. But gird your loins. Anti-LGBTQ people's true colors come shining through, and it ain't pretty. The Bleeped podcast got me thinking about censorship and self-censorship. I chatted with Matt Billy about his show and the insights he's gained in producing it. I find the people that I cover in the show, they're really inspiring to me. The range of topics I've covered, you know, could be drag queens trying to put on a drag queen story hour. The conservatives in the local area try to stop them. It could be a couple that left a negative review for an online retailer, and that retailer tried to fine them $3,500 for the negative review. What's interesting to me is that all these people, they're, they're confronted with a choice. They can either just kind of suck it up, accept the censorship, and move on with their lives, or they can go into this big battle that can take, you know, months or even years. And very often they choose the battle. It, it drains them. It takes a lot of energy to fight. But at the end of it, they often win. Uh, and often their stories are covered by the media in, in 500 to 700 word articles. But it doesn't quite go into, it doesn't really capture their emotion. And that's what I think my show does, is it shows the, the emotional roller coaster these people go through. But with Drag Queen Story Hour, it, there, there is this conspiracy theory floating around right now that Drag Queen Story Hour is not about reading storybooks about accepting everyone uh, to children, but is actually a way for the LGBT community to recruit new members, groom them into their alternative lifestyle. I listened to seven hours of a city council meeting where a lot of members of the public got up to speak and they denounced Drag Queen Story Hour. Uh, a lot of people who spoke were preachers who would, would quote parts of the Bible and say that you know God did not intend for people to be this way. So in Greenville, South Carolina, they put on a Drag Queen Story Hour. This was not covered in my episode. It was a successful Drag Queen Story Hour, but the security cost the city about $50,000 for that afternoon. Major protests, also, you know, standing room only inside the library. The, the parents and the children had a great time. But the city council immediately started talking about cutting 
the budget for the entire Greenville library system. And mysteriously, the library director and one other high-ranking library official are no longer employed by that library. They did not give an official reason. The city did not give an official reason. But the fact that it happened just a month or two after the, the controversial Drag Queen Story Hour leads us to believe that they were fired because they allowed the Drag Queen Story Hour to happen. Government using the power of the purse to try to censor people. The government, they fund all these jobs. They, they fund all this research. So they try to create this fear that if you don't say something along the lines of what they already wanted you to say, you might not get that contract renewed. I have a very personal example, actually. So my cousin, and I won't use his name, but my cousin actually works for a company that does environmental reports before uh, construction. He's been working at the company for a while, but when Donald Trump issued the statement that he didn't want the phrase climate change used in any more government documents, his boss actually told him to stop using the phrase climate change, right? So the censorship is real and, and people have to find other terms, other ways of saying it that don't use that word specifically. You know, it has a very, you know, 1984-esque feel to it. With self-censorship, it doesn't become a public story, right? It kind of happens in the dark and we don't really find out about it. With my Robert Maplethorpe exhibit episode, I, I do touch on self-censorship a little bit. When they took the Contemporary Arts Center in Cincinnati to trial for displaying obscene photographs, you know, beautiful photographs by Robert Maplethorpe, what it did was it had a chilling effect on the entire museum world. And now you can actually Google, Google this idea, is this museum self-censorship? And they actually teach courses in it. They, they tell you, they have a whole list of things that you should self-censor against. One of the goals of this show is to, to help inspire other people as well. I, I want to hold all these people up as examples that if you fight back against censorship, be it climate change censorship or other types of censorship, you can win. It's a hard road, but you can win, and the world is better for it if you fight it out. So that's what I'm trying to do. Two-year-old gay man. My name is Marvin. I called before, but you've ignored me. But this is serious business. You know, in the 90s, I was gay and comfortable and very active. Then I got hooked up with the born again, and I went ex-gay. Long story. I finally came out about a year and a half ago. I have been slowly re-emerging as a gay, and I went to this queer book club the other day. Well, now it's like four weeks ago. And uh, they, uh, this guy said, you're not really gay unless you have anal sex and really like it, which I used to in the 90s. But, you know, since then, I don't. I mean, I have it partly because I'm a Christian, and I have this thing about not doing it before I get married. But I don't know. Another part of it, I'm just not interested for some reason. And so this guy saying, well, it's because I'm not really gay and that I haven't really embraced being gay. And I'm like, you know, it's not what goes in my butt that makes me gay. It's, you know, anyway, it's very frustrating. And, um, you know, I, I feel confident in, in a lot of ways about who I am. But then I get these, you know, suspicions that maybe I'm still not accepting that I am, and that's going to influence the relationships that I have and all of that. Anyway, I've been thinking lately that maybe I should try a sex toy, which freaks me out. Uh, and, you know, you know, if in a way that was a an appropriate facsimile of the thing, you know. Anyway, thank you so much. I appreciate any help you can give me. Forgive me for ignoring your previous calls. Moving on. You know, it's not what goes on in your butt that makes you gay. It's what goes on in your heart that makes you gay. Uh, the stats show 25, 30% of gay men 
gay identified men, actually gay men, gay sex and gay relationship, having men never have anal sex. Uh, you are not alone. You seem overly concerned with this other person's opinion about your sexual identity. That seems to be a pattern for you. You were at one point overly concerned with Jesus's opinion about your sexuality or with your fundamentalist Christian buddies opinions about your sexuality, which is why you went from openly gay in the nineties to ex gay crazy, uh, a few years ago, and now welcome back. Welcome back to the reality-based world, and welcome back to your true and lasting and eternal and bedrock sexuality. But you just stop giving a shit about what other people think. You can be the gay man that you are, and you don't have to stick things in your butt. You don't have to stick dudes in your butt or sex toys. I don't see why you're disqualified from sticking a sex toy in your butt if that's what you want to do, if you want to experiment again with anal sex, uh, because you're Christian. I don't see how you're disqualified. You know, if you're invested in what Christians are and are not allowed to stick in their butts, I don't see how you arrived back at a gay, uh, <laughs> identity in the first place. So, but you know, now that I've told you to stop being overly concerned about what other people think, I'm going to end by telling you not to be too overly concerned about what I think. If you have decided that it violates your moral code, some special verse in Leviticus that was written in lemon juice that only you can see when you hold the Bible over a candle. Okay, your call, but you're a gay man. Butt sex or no butt sex. Let me set the scene for you. I'm on the PATH train. It's a subway that shuttles passengers from northern New Jersey to Manhattan. This is the train to 33rd Street. Stand clear of the closing doors. I love visiting New York City. It's where my parents were born. They both died of cancer a few years back, so heading into the city always reminds me of them. It's bittersweet. Sometimes on subways and commuter trains, people take liberty. They might clip their fingernails or engage in other personal grooming without the consent of fellow passengers. Some commuters converse publicly about private matters. On this short train ride, I just wanted to record the sounds as we traveled under the Hudson River. In the midst of the creaking and rumbling, punctuated with announcements, I couldn't avoid overhearing a conversation about cancer. Bubble and Squeak is written and produced by me, Peterson Toscano. I mostly make this show for me. Oh, and for my friend Christine, who has confessed that she gets nervous listening to most podcasts. The theme song is Worthless by the Jelly Rocks from the Bang and Whimper album. You also heard Silent Symphony by Eleventy Seven from the Sugar Fist album. And Off the Rails by The Pulses from their album Fast Feeling. All this music is from Rock Candy Recordings. You can find these songs on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you listen to music. Feel free to tweet at me at p 2 Sun, the letter P, the number 2, S-O-N. And thanks for listening.
For more shows like this one, visit rockcandyrecordings.com.